Welcome back, everyone. I am Julie Feal, Associate Vice President of Healthcare Access at the National MS Society. We are now going to hear about global health equity and patient engagement from Mr. Nicholas Brook. I know many of you are attending today from outside of the United States, so it will be great to hear this perspective as we take back lessons from today's symposium. Nicholas is the founder and executive director of The Synergist, an incubator and managing organization of multi-stakeholder platforms that brings key players together with the express aim of solving significant societal problems, including patient engagement through collective action. The Synergist also helps individual organizations to build capacity and capability to better engage with key stakeholders in partnerships across the public-private spectrum. Under Nicholas's leadership, the Synergist acts as a backbone, providing vision, strategy, stakeholder alignment, and execution on multiple international, multi-stakeholder programs. Bringing his Synergist and caregiver hats together, he is the executive director of pfmd.org, a pre-competitive multi-stakeholder global collaborative platform dedicated to stimulating innovation in medicine and device life cycles, digital health and health system throughout system, systematic patient engagement with patients. Mr. Brook, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Julie, and hi, everybody. Um, it's actually a pleasure, and thank you, NHC, for the invitation. And as you have heard, um, actually, I'm a caregiver. I have a, a son with several palsy. Uh, he's uh, today 14 years old. And so through my eyes of caregiver, I really have a, my own perspective on uh, health equity uh, or inequity uh, in this case. And so actually, that's what led me to the role I'm, I'm doing now, it started out of necessity for me and it has become actually a, a passion and um, um, a purpose for me. Uh, and actually I'm, I'm trying to solve these issues through patient engagement and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so before we get started on the topic of patient engagement and health equity, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction about uh, PFMD. So if we can go to, to the next slide, next slide. Please. So basically, the reason why PFMD exists is that eight, uh, nine years ago, a group of people, uh, multi-stakeholder people from the outset, had identified that patient engagement was on the table, but doing very little progress. And so at best, an organization had a good team, uh, good people to run it, but it was really far from being systematic. And so looking at the issue, they, they, look at, they looked at it uh, from a global perspective. And so they identified that all the patient engagement activities were very fragmented. And so this slide here is not meant to be holistic, but more meant to show a little bit what are the different issues and activities that are at stake when we talk about patient engagement. Uh, and so they identified that actually all this work was happening, but very little was connected, integrated, and making it uh, patient-centered. So actually the role of PFMD is to identify good practices and, and see on how we can replicate them, scale them and integrate them. At the time we started with drug development and the life cycle of medicine, but today, as Julie mentioned, uh, we are focusing on all health aspects through patient engagement, including digital health, um, medtech development, health systems, and still, of course, drug development. You can go to the next slide. So yeah. the focus and the purpose of PFMD is really to make sure we are co-designing co co the future of healthcare for patients, with patients, whatever health aspect we are um, covering. And so if you can go to the next slide, I just want to show you um, the type of membership we have. So we have a patient organization and different type of patient organization from US, from Europe, umbrella patient organization, disease specific patient organizations. We also have industry players. We have uh, academics. We have um, organization representing children and how to engage them in uh, the health systems. We have some health authorities. Uh, we have some HCA representative. And so we have quite a broad audience. Um, uh, uh, within our, our membership. And so if you can go to the next slide to finish that introduction. 
What we have noticed, no, just one back, please. Thank you. Uh, so basically, uh, something quite big happened in the last few years, and uh, it was this shift uh, from the risk of patient engagement to the risk of not involving patients. Um, and so not everywhere, not in all for health aspects, but certainly in drug development. Clearly, with some move from the regulators, with uh, some consciousness in the industry and all the work from the patient community, actually patient engagement really started to appear as a, a mean for better health outcome, for better, more efficient drug development. Uh, and actually, that's a shift that we started to happen. So if we look back, uh, actually, we can be quite grateful and we can appreciate all the progress that has been done. Now, if we look forward, there's still so much to, to be done moving forward. And so that's what we do with PFMD uh, and NFC. And so I'm really happy. So you have seen the multi-stakeholder approach and the kind of international collaboration we we, we push for, and so I'm, I'm really thankful for NHC to be a partner in that and to, to invite us, us to, to bring a, a kind of international, and I will say today, maybe more European perspective to, to the table. So you can go to the next slide. So a couple of months ago, when Omar asked me if what could be a topic and what could I say about um, health equity uh, outside of the US and especially, especially in Europe, I, I had to say that uh, even if it was a topic that was everywhere, it was probably not at the top of the agenda like it would be in the US today. And so actually things have changed. Uh, and I think there's a kind of convergence of crisis, um, vulnerable populations, uh, what, are, what are we mean by vulnerable population is actually increasing in terms of numbers. Uh, following the COVID crisis, the war in Ukraine, the, the economical crisis uh, we are facing quite strongly in Europe these days. And so actually, a couple of weeks ago, uh, so it's very recent, the European Health Forum, uh, Gastein, which is actually the meeting in Europe that gathers all the policymakers from all the European countries, was um, heading for uh, the moonshot for true European health union. And for in Europe, it's a very important topic Health is not uh, a European competence, so it's still at the country level. But given what happened with the COVID crisis, actually, uh, there is a window of opportunity for Europe to really position itself as one region having one health strategy. And so there's plenty of work to do, but still, um, there is a window of opportunity. And so they have done health equity, uh, one of the key pillars of this strategy. And on top of that, the, the, the really start, and I think that's a key difference with the US, the European, the universal health coverage aspect is kind of a, it's a starting point. Many things are in place there in Europe that will be, a, so the starting point will be completely different. But I wanted to look at the right hand of this slide and um, you will see, and there is a call for action there. Uh, as part of this, uh, the report that was leading to the event. And uh, this call to action was about working as a multi-stakeholder approach to solve this type of issue. And then there's a little paragraph at the bottom, which is um, talking about, uh, and I will read the last sentence, which is health strategies have a tendency towards Christmas tree approaches as interest groups fight for their issues or disease. And so the point they are trying to make is that if we want to solve it, we will have to solve it across stakeholders, but also across specific interests in multi-stakeholder multi groups. So I think the initiatives like we have the, the symposium today, and I think it's really important. I was seeing the, the objectives from Omar earlier today. One of them was to, to build further intelligence as a community, but also to generate more collaboration, more ideas, and to make all what we discussed today uh, actionable for further project in the future. And I think it's really important. That's how we will solve our issues. Um, and uh, forums like that are really too rare. I'll try to illustrate that in the second part of my presentation, but just to continue on the European context, if you can go to the next slide. When we look at the uh, European source of information, and I took one publication from the Royal College of uh, Physicians in London, and so basically, when you look at uh, when we talk about health inequalities, when we look at the major drivers, socioeconomic, equality and diversity, geography, inclusions, health and vulnerable groups, I think 
at that level is really not that different from what we talk in the US. I think we will be the difference will be at the margin when we look at the we look at the bigger picture. Now, if we if we look at the next slide, the way we describe the groups that um, we like to call sometimes the vulnerable groups, even if the the, the language is not always appropriate. But uh, ethnic minorities, migrants, Roma, prisoners, homeless people. Um, and so you see all this, the, the way we'll describe these groups is not that different, I think. And I'm talking for Europe and from what is my perception from the US, we can discuss that a bit later. But I think still at that level, we are talking more or less about the same type of group that we need to, to cover. And so if we continue, and that will be my last slide on the context in Europe, um, it's actually, um, an extract of uh, a report from WHO on health equity in the European region. Uh, and so, so basically what the report is building on is the fact that despite all the progress in health that have been done in Europe for the last 15 years, the inequalities in health access are actually uh, have not changed and if anything are growing. And so that was kind of a, interesting point that despite the the universal coverage uh, that we have in Europe, uh, universal health coverage we have in Europe, and, and despite all the progress, we still have some disparities and they continue to exist. So the report is suggesting different aspects and different uh, critical factors. Um, and so um, it will be income security and social protection are factor number one, living conditions are factor number two, social and human capital, such as isolation, lack of control, trust in others, and low educational outcomes as factor third, the three, sorry. And then the fourth one will be access to and quality of healthcare. So despite, um, uh, we could believe that with uh, universal health coverage in Europe, um, at least some degree of it, uh, uh, we, um, we are actually, doing well in terms of uh, um, equality, uh, actually as a force comes access to and quality to healthcare. And so that's how uh, the, we talk about that in Europe. And so that came to, for me, it comes to some conclusion here. And so we know we have very, very different health systems. We know we have different contexts uh, at the political level, at the cultural level, but still, when we talk about health inequalities, it seems that we are facing the same problems. And so if we have very different systems and contexts, but still face the, the same problems, my hypothesis of work is that the roots of the issue are probably the same. And so if we go to, to slide seven, I would like to start to, to discuss a little bit about what can patient engagement do for health equity if we start to think like that? Because personally, I'm, I'm convinced that if we want not to talk about it, but if we want to address it, it will work through patient engagement. And when, patient, when I mean patient engagement, it's patient community at large, including caregivers, including citizens. Uh, so it's really not the reductive term of, of, of patients uh, that I'm talking about here. What I'm going to do for the rest of my presentation is to go through uh, the existing tools of patient engagement that PFMD, but not only PFMD, uh, have developed uh, and uh, see where patient engagement could help health equity. Where do we have something in place already, but where also we need to develop it further. So if you go to the next slide, this is the uh, a screenshot of the web page uh, of the patient engagement management suite. So it's a, it's a toolbox uh, with tools and materials to help anybody, whatever stakeholder group, to uh, develop uh, and put in place patient engagement. It's a, so it's serving the patient committee to bring that to the table when engaging with any stakeholders or pharma companies, regulators, uh, physicians to work with patients to uh, actually design a project together. So it's uh, the same tool for everybody. The, the tools are meant to be supporting a discussion with all, everybody around the table. And so we have many of them and I will cover, uh, you see the whole toolbox in on the screens. If you, are, you have the, the web address at the bottom right, you can also scan the QR code and we will share the slides. So 
don't worry um, uh, on that front. I, was, I will focus on a couple of these tools. Um, and maybe sometimes you might be surprised at why I'm picking some tools. So if you can go to the next slide. I start by the seven patient engagement quality criteria that you should respect whatever the activity with patients. And so basically these are so shared purpose between the different entities around the table, respect and accessibility, of course, mainly for the patient community, representativeness of stakeholders. And so that's where there will be something about um, inclusion, equity and diversity. Role is responsibilities, capacity and capability for patient engagement, transparency in communication and documentation, and continuity and sustainability beyond the actual activity uh, or uh, project. And so just for your information, when we started to look for case studies that could illustrate the seven criteria, uh, we have developed what we call the book of good practices with, uh, that is accessible on the same PEM suite that, that I was showing. And so we have about 30 or 40 case studies today, and none of them tick the seven boxes. Uh, and so it's really important to understand this is a a support, uh, but when we started to look for best practices, no case study today would actually tick properly the seven boxes uh, of the seven criteria that you should respect when working together with patients. And so we have today, just to, to be concrete, uh, we have a, there is a guide of a 20, 30 pages um, uh, behind that visual. And so when it comes to representativeness of stakeholders, today we have some level of diversity um, activity in there, but we are thinking of developing a specific plugin where there will be a, a DEI uh, approach that we could actually make more specific to many, many activities, whether we, it's about digital health, a specific phase in drug development, about health system and our clinical practices. And so we are, um, we are starting to design where could we start developing specific DEI modules that could be added to the guidance there. If you go to the next slide. So that might be a little bit surprising to you, uh, we, but actually also in the work we have done in uh, fair contracts between patients and industry and fair remuneration and compensation of the patient committee when they come to the table. This is a piece of work that uh, we have started, um, I think nearly five or six years ago already uh, with uh, a, a huge collaboration and so, I wanted to show what, with this project, what collaboration, multi-stakeholder collaboration can lead to, but also make the link with uh, uh, health equity. So, so basically this uh, project started five or six years ago with a survey from WECAN, uh, which is a European umbrella organization for patient organization in cancer in Europe. Uh, they started a survey to understand about what were the, the, the conditions and the, the criteria for for contractual part, but also fair market value remuneration, remuneration of the patients. And so from that survey, PFMD and them worked together uh, to develop some guiding principles and some contracts. Then NEC in the US took this kind of international contract to do a US version and went one step further to develop the fair market value calculator. Uh, and so today, this fair market value calculator gives a kind of range, uh, a range for a rate uh, in the US, and we are trying to bring that to the rest of the world, starting with Europe. Uh, and so I just wanted to show that this is clearly a project where this international collaboration is really fostering great and very co coherent material, which is very needed to then convert the different entities we work with. Just to give you an example, uh, yesterday my colleague uh, Nicole was. Uh, in the European conference, bringing all the compliance people from industry uh, in one place. And the, the first question in Nepal to start with was um, about how many of them feel comfortable uh, about engaging with patients. And actually nearly half of them were either not comfortable at all or just not at ease to engage with patients. And then when we asked them, how many of you know about the fair market value calculator or the PFMD work on fair market value uh, actually, 85% of them, 85, had never seen about it, while on our side, we have the feeling that we have been communicating that for years all over the place. So there's still plenty of work to, to promote that. That's on the multi-stakeholder collaboration and how we can work together. 
Now, if you can go to the next slide. Actually, and that's something I really like with the fair market value calculator from NHC is that, yes, it gives a range at the end of the process, but it also forced the person using it to actually make sure you understand what type of experience you want at the table, what type of expertise, like understanding of drug development, research, and so on. But so it starts to force you to say, okay, but if I need an expert from that, I also need to have experience from caregivers or experience from young people. Uh, and so actually working with the tool is really an eye opener about how you build your representation when you are designing a project. And since that comes quite early as part of the project, there is really a window of opportunity again to add a plugin there specific to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we will be working on that. Uh, you can go to the next slide and you can go to the next slide directly. Um, another piece of work um, that uh, we have been doing is the how to guide for patient engagement in the early discovery and preclinical -pre phases. And there too, there is a moment in this guide that uh, actually start to develop, okay, which type of patient would you like to bring around the table? What type of insight you are looking for? And how can you make sure it is representative enough? And that actually will be a very strategic, like anything in patient engagement, we know that we want to pay patient engagement to start as early as possible to make sure that it influences the whole life cycle and to have the maximum value across the process. But that's also then for the same reason, a very strategic point in time in drug development to make sure that we generate diversity from the outset. And so diversity and, and uh, inclusion are really, I see that as a mean for equity as an outcome. And so sometimes we talk about these three terms and, and, and we mix all of them. But in this case, I think it will be really important to develop like uh, further tools to help people that early in the process to design the right uh, diversity and inclusion plan from the outset. You can go to the next slide, please. So uh, same thing with protocol design. Um, and so there's another how to guide building on the seven criteria that uh, you have seen a little bit earlier, but specific for the activity of designing clinical trial. Uh, and so there as well, how to make sure when we design the clinical trial, we can um, make sure we take all inclusion aspect into account. We have done, the, we, we work on this idea of representation when we had done, the, we had done the, the guides like two years ago, if I remember well. Uh, and so now really it's time to make sure that we add a specific plugin on the EY and that's what we are about to, to, to do together. And so I was focusing on clinical trial on this one because if you go to the next slides, it is actually, um, and you have the source at the, the bottom of the slide, but it's actually a, a real issue uh, about um, the access to clinical trials. And if you go to the next slide, you see that we can, we have a project right now that is ongoing, which is actually focusing on two of the issues. So first understanding the protocols and then the issue of false matches. And actually I can even develop the issue of access to the information most of the time, patients that could um, that could have access uh, don't even know the trial exists, or the physician don't know the trial exists. And so, if you go to the next slide, basically we we have a project there that we call the clinical trial distribution network, which is addressing a problem which is slightly different than what I have discussed so far, because we one of the issue. Uh, of clinical trial is not necessarily we a lot of people are talking about how to access it how can we build a new clinical trial finder and so that's how we started the question and our quest on on this issue however we realized very quickly that the issue was not at all the the client or the finder the clinical trial finder to actually work out the data, that was the data initially because the data is really poorly designed to serve a diversity purpose. And so there, what we are doing is not trying to do yet another clinical trial finder, but more to find a way to better share initially the information and make sure that it's actually uh, redistributed on a large scale. And I will explain that a little bit further if you go on the next slide. You can click, there is a build up. Yes, and one more, please. 
Thank you. So, so basically things like, um, so I think most of you are aware of that, but uh, in the protocol information, actually there is this open field where we would put the, which stage of cancer it is about. We would put more demographic type of information. Uh, the age range might be slightly different from one to the other. And so basically it's not structured data. And the fact it's not structured data means that actually it's very difficult to, to build search engines. There are organizations out there that try to address this issue with artificial intelligence. So how can we restructure very poor structured data? Uh, there are other organizations, a lot of patient organizations are requalifying clinical trial information and sharing that through their network. Uh, and so what we want to do is actually, we want to work from the really the source of the issue is like, how can we structure better data from the outset? And so you can go to the next slide. Please click a couple of time. One more and one more, yes. So basically what we are trying to do here is to work from the outset uh, with the sponsors, but also with patient organization to add a plain language summary, uh, and then to feed a central tool. And we are not aiming to replace city.gov. We're actually aiming to work with them. At this stage, we try to make a demonstration in breast cancer and in oncology in, more, uh, in general, that actually uh, there is a different way to approach it. And so basically we want to develop a richer, better structured data source that can push out to patient organizations and to physicians, but there is also a feedback loop. Uh, so basically when patient organizations do like a lot of them today, requalify complete and enrich clinical trial information, Basically, not only they can continue, of course, to distribute it to their network, but they can bring it back into the central engine that can then redistribute the information globally. And so with that type of system, we really hope that we can then design as a response, a better design clinical trial finder designed for a given community, given for, for a very specific region, given for very specific profiles, uh, because we have actually developed a, a data source which is much more flexible and much less standardized with limitation of standardization. So that's another project which is designed from a patient engagement perspective, but to address a diversity issue. And I will finish with the last project uh, that we have there, uh, which is about the fusion of patient engagement and patient experience data. And so you see it with like the, the DNA visual here. There are so many topics and it's, it's particularly the case in real world evidence these days, but basically where we think that data is replacing engagement. And so the, the whole point of the project we have here is to actually articulate not only that there is not good data without good patient engagement, the other way around is true too. There is no good patient engagement if there is not good data as an outcome but how we make them work together. And you can go to the, the next slide. Actually, when do we need to use which tool to generate and how do we engage with patients to generate which type of data? There was very, very little resource made available for that purpose. So basically NAC is working right now on the patient-centered core impact sec projects, which is actually a way to make sure that all patient unmet needs are first listed and then prioritize and actually helping define which tool or which patient engagement activity you can do to identify these tools. But then from there, when we have identified the core impacts, how can we actually develop the measurements that can then serve decision process for regulators, for payers, or for um, clinicians to improve clinical practice. And so basically that's also work in progress. And this is actually really helping to identify also that there is a kind of roadmap process into it. So when do we need to do what? And there too, we will actually um, include the right diversity elements uh, or the right diversity question to make sure that the project and the data generated at the end of the, the process is actually strongly anchored into a diverse and representative uh, sample of uh, patient engagement. And so I wanted to finish uh, with uh, two points. If you can go to the next slide. 
I started with the European position that we need to have a multi-stakeholder approach. And actually, when we look at it, the FDA is also calling, uh, in this case, if I remember well, it's more on the clinical trial, but still um, uh, calling for multi-stakeholder collaboration. And so it's really interesting to see that key decision makers, whether it's policy makers in Europe or FDA in the US here, are starting to recognize the need to look at this together. And so if you go to the next slide, I think what we have right now on, um, on the table, we even even like the one we are in today, um, is the opportunity not only to, to start to build intelligence together, share different perspectives be between different stakeholder groups, different entities with all our different hats, but we also, because NHC, because PFMD, and because other platforms like, like that exist, uh, to actually turn that into action, identify which project we can design and which project we can design that will serve not only one group for one specific point in drug development, in digital health design, or anything else, but that actually can serve the entire system because it was designed right with the common interest um, in focus. So that's that's what I want to thank NHC first to organize this session and that's a call to action for all of us now to, to actually turn the good discussion that we have in this type of meeting into actions and projects to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brook, for that excellent presentation. Um, we do actually have time for some questions. Um, if there are any questions that have come in from the audience, I have a few here for you that I'd like to get started with. Um, I think due to the pandemic, many US researchers have been singularly focused on their constituents in the United States. How can organizations here that are participating uh, partner with other groups to learn about global issues and initiatives, um, especially because many of the issues that you've mentioned, like diversity and clinical trials, affect many regions? So if I understand the question right, so, so you are, you are, the question is how to engage as a US specific organization with the international uh, groups that are also focusing on the same type of issue. And so I think um, uh, there are different platforms. And so clearly uh, position PFMD as one of them, but uh, there are many other platforms where patients for given conditions or for specific purposes can actually meet and work on that. The feeling I have is that it generally, generally speaking, it's not the primary focus and it's very often a topic left aside or an activity left aside. But I know that NHC is planning or considering planning uh, a kind of a, an open window to international initiatives where any patient organization in the US could contribute to it. Uh, we have PFMD, there are many multi-stakeholder groups that are European specific too, but really looking forward to connect with international groups. In Asia too, uh, there are multi-stakeholder platforms that are meant to be maybe Asia specific, but we they are really looking at the rest of the world on how they can develop further. Core, the center of regulatory excellence will be one of them. And so depending on the needs, I think it's important maybe to provide a mapping of these initiatives to start with. But what I see me at the international level is that the opportunities are like, uh, there are many of them available. So it's really a question of uh, uh, having this mapping in mind and actually making some choices on where to engage on that. Very helpful, thank you. So you spoke about patient engagement data and patient engagement during your presentation. How do organizations ensure that engage, the engagement they are doing is meaningful and sufficient? So I think it's like, um, uh, my feeling is that depending on who, what is your focus as an organization or as a team within an organization, you have a bias towards more data or towards more on the engagement aspect of it. And so I think it's really important for everybody to make sure that, to understand that decision maker will make decisions based on data, whatever the stories we can bring to them. And the other way around, data alone without the contextualization of that data 
uh, will actually might lead to very wrong decisions. And um, uh, there are very strong case studies uh, suggesting um, with the using the NASA as a, as an example there, where the NASA is actually known for the the mantra, which is like in, I think it's in God we believe the, the rest of you be, bring us data, but they are known that because that drove them to failure with Challenger, and uh, and so I think it's really important that. Uh, if you want to make sure that there is a qualitative and meaningful engagement, first, the quality of the exchange needs to be, the patient engagement part of it needs to be very well designed, but we really need evidence-based engagement to successfully influence health systems. So I think it's important to have that in mind and to really play with the two. Great. So what do you see as the most important global health equity um, issue right now? And then I guess a follow-up to that would be, so the immediate, and then maybe over the next two to three years. That's a big question. So, <laughs> so I, I think I will build, um, uh, for me, on the biggest opportunity. And uh, if I had known how important this fusion of patient engagement and patient experience data is and I see the impact it has with the start of the work we have done for the last 12 months, I would have done that much earlier because it's actually where the different stakeholders find a, a common ground uh, and uh, can sit at the table and start to speak the same language. Uh, and so for me, the most important topic is probably to make sure, and that's why I, I was presenting the work we do in HC uh, with PCCIS and the PN Pet Fusion project, I think this is actually the, the place where we will really find a way to bring all stakeholders together and take into account all the needs from the different, uh, from, from all of them. So I think it's for me, that's probably the biggest opportunity we have to have a proper multi-stakeholder dialogue and to solve the societal issue we are confronted with. So for me, I'm talking about um, the opportunity there. And as you have seen, I'm, I'm a great believer that patient engagement will actually unlock many of the issues uh, in terms of health equity and inclusion. So, so I think that's, uh, for me, that's the way, and that's why I would prioritize this one. In the longer term, I think we need more global harmonization. Uh, there is some start of work on the regulatory front. Uh, so the regulatory groups globally start to start and it's very early days to align, but I think I would like to see the shift where is still a regulatory focus for regulatory purpose. And I would like to go to a more patient-centered health systems where the regulators and the payers and the physicians comes around the patient and not the patient have to go to each of them in, in silos. So that would be my, my moonshot in the, in the long term. It does seem like a moonshot indeed. Um, I'm just gonna pause for a moment and see if there are any further questions. Um, So seeing no questions, um, I'd just like to send a great thank you so much, Mr. Brook, for the great presentation and all that wonderful information. We will now take a 15 minute break. Please take this opportunity to participate in a one minute focus meditation, stretch your legs and grab a snack, and we will reconvene at 2.45 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Brook. Thank you very much.